Good Friday. It seemed like a beautiful weather. And uh, when I was coming, there was a lot of traffic there, and I was worried that I would get in time or not. Then I was just uh, relaxed that uh, Dr. Chaudhary is, uh, she's uh, going to be delivering lecture, and she knows how to relax the audience. So she will probably start her relaxing exercises and some music and all that. <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, sleep. And, um, you know, that my topic is not like any, you know, science or any complicated. I'm going to talk about things which we all know and we grew up with that, but we kind of never paid attention. I mean, I still remember uh, when I was uh, in high school and I would wake up in the morning and I would look tired and, you know, my mom would say, I know, you didn't sleep enough, you are up late night. And then if she will see me tired or depressed, she'll say, you're not sleeping right. And, you know, I'll say, you know, mother is just talking about, probably every mother say, oh, you know, my kid is not sleeping right. But now we are learning that, you know, if your mood is not right in the morning, probably you didn't sleep good at night. And uh, still, uh, doctors don't ask their patient, you know, like uh, patient come with million complaints and they still forget to ask, sir, how are you, how are you sleeping? How is your sleep? And patients don't think that is anything significant, so they don't share that with their physicians. So they start treating with different disorders and really miss one of the important things, which could be the sleep problem patient is having for whatever reason. So um, I'm going to just talk about, uh, you know, simple things about sleep and then most common sleep disorder, which... Uh, Actually, after age of 40, about 25% of people might have that. And, uh, you know, it still goes unrecognized. And, uh, okay, let's see here. So what you do is by this time okay, I'll sure. put the new. Okay, just so this. I just keep. Keep doing. And okay, I'll, thank I'll you. Put some. So, um, you know, the best way to uh, figure out that if somebody's having any sleep problem or not, or simple questions, which you know, just for us, uh, like not a patient, even us, if we see that anything is there, like when I wake up in the morning, I'm still fatigued or tired or, you know, during driving if there's any misses or, you know, dozing off where there's a red light, and am I concentrating in a class? And I know you are all concentrating now, but, you know, <laughs> and how is your short-term memory? When we don't sleep good, actually, the first thing is affected over memory. Like, I will be talking with somebody and I would still not remember his name. That is like, I just met this person yesterday and I'm thinking, oh my God, what's his name? That's what we lose first. And we even lose track of conversation when we are talking like, what was I saying? Those things start appearing when we are not uh, sleeping right. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so average uh, sleep, uh, we all know, hopefully, that is eight hours. And it can range from five to ten hours. I have yet have to see, actually, people who say, I sleep five hours and I'm like a solid all day. I don't, I'm not cranky, I'm not kind of yelling at people, I'm not throwing charts if he's working, you know, if he's a surgeon. If he's not throwing a chart, he's good. And uh, so its average is eight hours. There are four stages of sleep, and it's a REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Why REM sleep is important? REM sleep is a sleep which we get later in our sleep, and that's the sleep which most people like because we get to see dreams, things which we like. And uh, a non-REM sleep is the one which, uh, you know, include our 
uh, superficial sleep and deep sleep. And deep sleep is the restoring sleep. Actually, if anybody doesn't get to deep sleep, he is not going to be as refreshed as they would expect or they would like to be. And uh, so one third of our time we spend in sleep. So God did, did make you know, sleep important because all the day of work which we do, our body recovers from all the damages. Uh, the cells kind of uh, recover from and they restore. And then there is a conservation of energy. So sleep, one third of our life which we spend has a real purpose for us. Uh, <clears throat> so there are a few symptoms, as I mentioned before, if somebody is having a problem in their sleep, which could be for any reason, like uh, somebody goes to bed at 11 at night and wakes up 7 in the morning, but then he's still tired or she's still tired. They are sleepy during the day. And I don't see anybody sleepy here. They are irritable. And anxiety is also one of the complaints and forgetfulness, poor performance at work. And uh, actually, this family discord, sometimes those you know, people who take care of the issue, they forget that if some, one person is not sleeping in a family, it can affect really. And then accidents. That is considered actually one of the most common reason for accidents, sleepless drivers at night. And those drivers actually could be sleeping, but still they are not sleeping right. That's why they are getting into accidents. Uh, so what are the most common reasons people will have those issues with their sleep? So one is the poor sleep hygiene, obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, and restless leg syndrome. Out of that, what, I, what the data has shown, the most common reason is poor sleep hygiene. And then the most common medical disorder which affects our sleep is obstructive sleep apnea. And then insomnia. Insomnia also is a very common medical disorder which affects actually uh, more people than obstructive sleep apnea, which is insomnia is inability to fall asleep or you fall asleep but then you wake up not refreshed. And restless leg syndrome, that's the other a disorder which is a medical disorder where right before going to sleep you feel restlessness in our legs. So a patient would want to get up and walk to feel better. It's very classic, you don't need any test for that. It's just a history if somebody gives that. Patient can wake up at night with this complaint and then, so it will disturb their sleep. So uh, <clears throat> I'm just gonna talk right now about obstructive sleep apnea. So what is obstructive sleep apnea? It's a disorder which basically is manifested by snoring and then airway collapse when we fall asleep. So during sleep, our airway closes or it narrows down to a point where it will wake you up briefly or it will cause decrease in oxygen saturation. And it will lead to fragmented sleep. So if somebody is sleeping, say, eight hours, but if they have sleep apnea, their eight hour is probably fragmented 100 times. So they are going to wake up tired and sleepy during the day. But the most important thing about that uh, sleep apnea is that it is not only that somebody will be tired and sleepy during the day, this disorder has a serious consequences. And it is very common, but it has serious consequences. So why does it have serious consequences? Because when during sleep the airway collapses, it's like somebody coming and choking you. Like if somebody is choking you, what we are gonna do? 
we're going to fight back. We're going to, you know, try to. So during sleep, we are basically choked. Airway collapses, and we can't open because we are sleeping. So we will try to open that. And finally, brain says, man, you can't do it. I have to take over. So brain wakes us from sleep. So sleep is interrupted, and we start breathing again. So during that process, when we are choked and we were making effort to open our airway, our heart rate goes up and blood pressure goes up. And then, you know, it's like if somebody's going to choke me, it's going to be a serious thing. So I'm going to be fighting back. So my adrenaline is going to go up. So body all fight uh, hormones and chemicals are released. So if this happens all night, every night, so those, uh, uh, those catecholamines and blood pressure going up and down, up and down, heart rate going up and down, that leads to a damage in the blood vessels and that what causes the complications associated with sleep apnea. And those complications are high blood pressure, heart disease, risk of stroke, diabetes, and um, depression, cardiac arrhythmias. And more and more, we are focusing on the sleep disorder, actually. We are learning more. So there have been several you know, uh, studies and uh, reviews which showed that patients who have heart disease, 50% have sleep apnea are patients who have diabetes. So if somebody comes with diabetes, if I see 50 patients, I know 25 are gonna have sleep apnea. So it's like we need to check for that. We need to ask those patients, how do you sleep? And if they are, you know, look little obese, we will check that. But uh, even if they are not looking, somebody will have sleep apnea, we should ask them and check them for sleep apnea if they snore or if they say, yeah, I don't sleep good. And uh, lately, you know, we have learned that insulin resistance is, uh, sleep apnea is one of the reason for that, which means difficult to control diabetes because of those release of chemicals, a catecholamines at night, it leads more requirement of insulin for diabetes patients. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, obstructive sleep apnea here, you know, if somebody has obstructive sleep apnea, basically that patient can see a lot of specialists, starting from Dr. Choudhury, then a cardiologist, then a pulmonologist, an ENT doctor, because the thing is, those patients, if their sleep apnea is not diagnosed and not treated, they could have issues with mood problems, di uh, di depression, anxiety, and uh, if it is, um, you know, there for like 20 years or 10 or 15 years, increased risk of high blood pressure and uh, cardiac issues and the risk of stroke and TIAs. <clears throat> so how we... <clears throat> Uh, diagnose sleep uh, apnea. It's a, uh, you know, clinical history as we went over and uh, then we do a sleep study to make a diagnosis and that's uh, done in sleep lab or now we actually are moving more towards doing a home sleep study. And that home sleep study we check like uh, oxygen saturation and flow, like it tells, you know, how many times somebody stopped breathing and uh, in sleep lab, we do an EEG. So we monitor their sleep, their stages of sleep, their leg movements, and uh, then we you know, get their stages of sleep and then respiratory events, how many times somebody stopped breathing and all that. Uh, so how we treat that sleep apnea? <clears throat> As I explained to you, sleep apnea is a disorder where airway collapses when we fall asleep. So, then patients 
sleep with a mask and that sends an air pressure which acts like an air splint and it keeps airway open while patients sleep and uh, it basically eliminates those all uh, events, uh, obstructive events and snoring and that practically also help their clinical symptoms but it has shown that uh, it helps, actually it improves their blood hypertension. Patients who sometimes we see young people, they are on three blood pressure medication and still it's like their blood pressure is still high. If they are diagnosed and treated with CPAP, it has been shown that clearly blood pressure control is much, much better. There are other devices to treat sleep apnea. There are some oral devices which are getting more popular. A lot of patients, you know, a lot, 30% of people don't like to, you know, fly F-16 kind of thing with putting masks on their nose. Though it, to me, it doesn't seem like it's that difficult. But uh, there are 30% people who, who can't sleep with a mask. Uh, for them, there is a dental device which is, you know, fitted by dentists who are specialized in that and then they what it does it it uh, bring their mandible forward so that there's a space when they fall asleep and if for some reason somebody has severe sleep apnea and uh, even with the uh, CPAP we can control that then a surgical option is available actually in my 10-year practice, I have not uh, sent a single patient for uh, surgery because most of them were able to, uh, you know, tolerate CPAP, but uh, that definitely, and it's very extensive procedure. So if somebody has really severe sleep apnea, it might bring their uh, severity to a lower level. <clears throat> So just, uh, you know, while here I'm talking in an adult audience, but that doesn't mean that this disorder is only for adults. A lot of pediatric patients, kids actually, have sleep apnea. I myself diagnose, uh, end up seeing, you know, every month one or two kids who are diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea and had to figure out how to treat them because it affects them also. Uh, significantly and what are their uh, common symptoms are almost the same like snoring at night and during their you know sleep there are pauses and uh, bed wetting is one of other significant complaint for the kids which they come with during sleep like choking or increased work of breathing and frequent awakenings but the most important uh, symptom for kids is that their poor performance in school, like uh, the, and, and then their symptom just mimic ADHD, and that's why it's very important. Like uh, you know, a lot of kids are diagnosed with ADHD, but it's been noted that at least 35 percent of those probably had sleep apnea, which was missed. So that's why it's important that uh, we keep that in mind. So behavior problems in kids, morning headaches, aggressive behavior, and poor school performance. That's one of their markers. If you know, they, if they have that, we can see how they they are going to present. So I'm just going to talk about now a second disorder, which is insomnia. That is inability to fall asleep, inability to maintain sleep, waking up, feeling tired and waking up earlier than desired. Uh, there is, you know, short-term insomnia, which we probably all come across, like moving from one town to another, you know, one can have, one can lose sleep. You know, we hear that, or, you know, I just moved and I can't sleep now, I'm under stress. That's kind of a common uh, and then there are other uh, short term is like a jet lag comes under that category or sometime, you know, something, you know, bad happens and we kind of get under stress or lose our sleep. 
that is usually less than three months and it kind of gets better. And then the chronic insomnia is like more than three months symptoms are chronic. And uh, that's what which is very difficult to uh, treat, but uh, if it is not treated, it does affect adversely to somebody's you know, overall mood and their energy level. And uh, that's, as I just mentioned, uh, insomnia can also lead to overweight or obesity, hypertension, risk of heart disease, risk of diabetes. So sleep is a serious issue when, uh, you know, we kind of uh, talk about all other uh, disorders, but one third over life, which is, uh, we kind of don't pay that attention. But that, in, in reality, is linked with all medical disorders which we are learning. Just uh, two weeks ago, there was a big headline, you might have read that, that if uh, sleep apnea is linked with cognitive deficits. So what does that mean? That means if I have a sleep apnea and if I'm not treated, I may get dementia very early in my life, like, uh, you know, a dementia mean more forgetfulness and all that, and, and that was uh, pretty, you know, highlight for last two weeks that was. So we learned one more thing that if uh, we do not diagnose and treat sleep disorders, we are gonna face serious consequences. So at the end, I'm gonna mention one very common phenomenon. And that is like, actually I tell you this. Last night when I was preparing for this lecture, and I said, okay, man, I'm not gonna have cell phone. And I turned it off for hour and a half before my bedtime, put it in the other room. Believe me, I woke up very fresh. And uh, this is a very, very common problem. And now we start learning. You know, the smartphones can cause insomnia, telephones can cause brain disorders, and the right away for telephone companies came up with no, 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 it has nothing to do with this disorder and that disorder, but it's pretty common sense. We know all, we all know that, but we want to hear some study which shows that if you don't turn your phone off right before sleep, like an hour, it is linked to a serious issues, then we are gonna listen. And now we have a lot of data. So how that works? You know, this telephone has a light there iPhones and iPads, and that light turn give a signal to our brain that it's still daylight. What are you doing? Still enjoy. So then melatonin, which is released to put us to sleep, and that is a hormone for night. That is not released. Number two, it tells our circadian rhythm it's still daylight. So now, we may fall asleep, but then our sleep is not gonna be solid sleep. So we are gonna have, and I tell you this, this thing, where is that? I don't have with me, Fitbit. That is the thing which tells you how good you sleep. You can all test that. It will tell you how many times you are restless during your sleep. So if uh, you know we don't take care of those sleep hygiene things, which include turning off our cell phones and iPad and laptops one hour before sleep. If we don't do that, we will face those consequences. And what are those, you know? We are gonna have poor sleep, we are gonna wake up still tired. And then you can imagine if we are waking up tired, all the consequences which I talked about earlier. So, <clears throat> Let's see here. So how we treat uh, insomnia and uh, sleep hygiene. So there are simple few things which actually we all know but we don't follow that. That is in your sleep bedroom is only for sleep, period. And my wife will probably listen to that too. Bedroom is only for sleep. It is not for TV and it is not for your work. Number two, no caffeine after three or four p.m. 
no chocolate after 4 p.m. And actually, that's my personal experience. Since I stopped drinking tea after 6 p.m., I sleep much better. And actually, I am supporting this with data. I'm not making it up. Number three, no alcohol at night to make you fall asleep. If you want to fall asleep with alcohol, you probably should have alcohol drip. That's how you will sleep, because it's going to make you fall asleep, but then you're going to wake up through the night. <clears throat> and then the second thing is stimulus control. What is stimulus control? Stimulus control is no iPad and iPhone in the room. So I keep only when I'm on call, and I'm trying to keep it away. And then, you know, there should not be no disturbance, uh, light or noise. Obviously, I just have to mention here that the patients are the most unfortunate people. When they come to hospital, that's the time when they don't get any sleep because nobody cares. Every 10 minutes, somebody come to their room and keep waking them up. Even don't let them sleep. They actually cry, believe me. They cry in the morning that I'm getting zombies. So the hospital is full of zombie doctors and zombie patients, believe me. <laughs> Okay, so then sleep restriction. That means that if you can't fall asleep for 20 minutes, don't keep trying. Get up, go and read a book, but don't watch a movie. And then when you fall asleep, then come back to your room. What is cognitive therapy? That is basically, where is Dr. Chodi? Dr. Chodi does that well, you know, in his clinic. And you just have to understand what are your issues, why you are not sleeping, and, and you know, just take things easy, practically. So, and then it's a behavior therapy that's also kind of realizing that what are the problems which is affecting my sleep. So when you kind of analyze that, you kind of isolate your brain and then kind of don't take too serious about sleep, and then sleep is going to come back. And. Uh, just uh, last thing, I'm kind of getting close to my time, that uh, medications are not the best way to treat uh, insomnia. But this is a last resort. And I tell you this, this drug which was my most favorite drug, Ambien, I mean, believe me, <laughs> patient will take Ambien, they will get out of bed, go eat sandwich in their kitchen, will come back, and during their way, they'll probably kick somebody, and then fall asleep in the morning, they will have no recollection what they did at night. And that, uh, they can even same way, get up and drive a car, and then come back and sleep. And I'm not making it up, this has been shown. So it's a pretty risky drug, which I used to use a lot, and I have cut back. And um, so, we need to try all other ways to treat our insomnia, but if we don't have any other options left, then obviously we would use medications. There's a new drug, orexin receptor antagonist. Orexin is in our brain, which basically makes us awake. And uh, that uh, medication kind of try to block that so that we are not awake. So that's just a new drug. I haven't used that yet. So. Take home message for this discussion. Number one, sleep good, eight hours. If you can't sleep good, see somebody who will help you make sleep good. Number two, exercise. Do something, play squash, tennis, because I think I feel best when I play squash and sleep eight hours. Thank you very much. If any question.